Hi there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship with a video about the testing pyramid for Python programmers. So in a previous video, um, we talked about the continuous integration and continuous delivery process and why it's very, very important and very beneficial to businesses to be able to ship code as often as they need to. Um, and in order to do that, technically, we may need to make sure that our code is one being continuously um, integrated into the trunk, the main branch, um, by all members of the team, but also that um, it's built and tested on a separate machine so we can be confident that what we've got in version control actually works. It's actually shippable. Now, there's a number, there's my um, the Circle CI continuous integration um, dashboard here. And there's a number I want to draw your attention to, and that's that's this number here, which is how long it takes to build and test the code, essentially. Now, this is a very, very important number for continuous delivery. Um, the longer it takes to build and test the code, um, the less often we're going to be able to build and test it, essentially. Um, so if, for example, you've got a suite of um, browser-based tests that take hours to run, then your builds are going to be uh, necessarily potentially very slow. Um, and that's going to slow down the whole continuous delivery process. Think of it as being a bit like um, the, um, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? It's your metabolism, if you like, the metabolism of software development. And if you've got slow builds, then you, you're delivery cycles are going to have a slow metabolism. Delivery is going to be slow, and that's going to become a serious bottleneck. And I see it on Teams all the time. And the knock-on effect for um, delivery and then for the businesses that are counting on that delivery can be quite severe. I've seen it bring down some pretty big businesses because it took them sometimes weeks to test their software. So the idea of, of you know, keeping something continuously shippable was um, just impossible. So it's a very important number. It's very important that we can build and test the software as quickly as possible. And as your code base grows, you'll tend to find that the bulk of that time is the time that it takes to run the tests. So what we're going to talk about in this video is how we optimize our test suites so that they run as quickly as possible. So I have a PowerPoint slide prepared here. Um, always have a PowerPoint slide prepared. Um, this is what we call the testing pyramid. If we imagine our test is sort of pictured um, by rising execution time. So at the top of this little graph here, we've got our tests that take the longest to run. And at the bottom, we've got the tests that take the least amount of time to run. Then if you've got a well-organized, well-optimized test suite, um, then you're going to have a, a sort of a pyramid shape the right way up, where the base of the pyramid, the bulk of your tests, um, is going to be made up of fast-running tests. Let's call them unit tests. But I'm going to qualify what I mean here. I mean tests that run fast, and that usually means tests that do not have direct external dependencies. So tests that don't involve reading files or talking to databases or using web services or anything like that, because that's going to slow our test suites down. So, so I'll qualify. When I say unit tests, I don't mean tests for a specific method or a function. I mean tests that do everything in memory in the same process so they run fast. There's no external dependencies. And we want most of our tests to be like that. But we will need necessarily to test some of the interactions between different parts of our system. So we're probably going to need some integration tests as well, tests that read from files, read, uh, write to databases, and so on and so forth. But we would like to have far fewer of those than we have unit tests. And then finally, at the top of our parent pyramid, the least number of tests, the slowest running tests, would be our, our system or end-to-end -end test. So for example, if it's a website testing through the browser, and that's going to involve the whole technology stack. So it's going to involve all of the external dependencies, all of the sort of the pieces of the uh, jigsaw, if you like. So we're looking to, um, to create test suites that for the most part are made up of fast running, in inverted commas, unit tests, tests that don't involve external dependencies. Um, what are we actually going to test with our unit tests? Well, as much as possible, we want to test the logic of our code. So I'll give you an example. If you've got a, um, a business rule about how mortgage repayment should be calculated when someone's applying for a mortgage, we've got a number of choices as to how we could test that automatically. One way we could test it would be to test it through the browser. So submit a mortgage application get a response and check the numbers in the response to see if they've been calculated correctly. 
but that fails to separate a lot of concerns. There's a lot that can go wrong there, basically. Um, n n that also includes the actual calculation itself. If we want to know whether or not the mortgage repayments are calculated correctly, we can actually test the, the component or the unit or the class or the module that does that particular piece of work with a unit test. So as much as possible, we're going to try to test the logic of our application using unit tests. Now, a lot of people will say, ah, but that doesn't include sort of, for example, the user experience or the UI. Well, if you think about it, a UI is made up of also made up of units. Um, and with a little bit of ingenuity, it is quite straightforward to architect your, architect your application in such a way that the logic of the user experience is represented in memory by classes or whatever. Um, and that can also be unit tested. Um, so with a little bit of, you know, clever architecting, we often find that it's possible to unit test the bulk of our code. Um, and as we'll see that a lot of that comes down to the way that our code is designed, the way that it's architected. So if we tested all the logic of our application using these unit tests, what's left to test with integration tests? Well, we're testing the contracts between the different parts of the system. So do they actually talk to each other correctly? So when we call a web service, are we sending the right parameters? Is the web service giving us the correct response and so on and so forth? So we're testing the contracts and we would have far fewer of those hopefully if our code has been architected to isolate that kind of, um, that kind of work. Uh, and finally, if we tested all the logic with our unit test and we tested all the contracts, between the different parts of the system with their integration tests. What's left to test? Well, if you've ever heard yourself say these words as a developer, it worked on my machine. Um, the last thing we need to worry about is the system configuration itself. So once it's actually deployed into the target environment, onto the target platform, and all of the dependencies are brought together into a single system, does it actually work? Or are there differences in that environment that mean that it doesn't work? For example, localization issues or platform issues or um, that kind of thing. So we're looking as much as possible to test the bulk of our code um, with unit tests, fast running tests with no external dependencies. And on a typical system, a business system, for example, we might have thousands or even tens of thousands of these fast running unit tests. Um, an order of magnitude less, hopefully, of these integration tests, tests that do actually cross the boundaries between um, the process that we're testing and other processes like web servers and um, database servers and that kind of thing and the file system. And we might hope to end up with maybe hundreds of those, not thousands. And then finally, at the top, our system test, because we're not testing the logic, because we're not testing the contracts, we really just need a cherry picking of user journeys just to check, just to touch all the parts of the system, basically, and make sure that it all has been put together correctly and in the target environment, it actually works. So to use the analogy of, of testing a car, we, we might use unit tests to test all of the individual components like the spark plugs and so on. And then we might assemble these components together into, um, into um, larger assemblies. So we might, for, for example, want to test that the radio not only works by itself, but actually works within the electrical system of the car. So a sort of an integration test there. And then finally, when it's all been put together, we put the key in the ignition and we take it for a, a test drive. And that's essentially what we're doing with our system tests there. So we're aiming to have a pyramid shaped distribution of, of, of tests in terms of execution time. And that pyramid needs to be the right way up. So the base of the pyramid needs to contain all of our unit tests. When we have an upside down pyramid, when the bulk of our tests, for example, are system tests, we can end up with test suites that take a very long time to run. And that really slows down the feedback cycles. It slows down the build cycles, which slows down delivery, which then creates bottlenecks all over the place, it creates all sorts of problems because we now have a very slow delivery metabolism, if you like, and that's going to create all sorts of health problems, not just for software development, but for the business that's relying on that. Everything is going to get very difficult and very expensive and very risky. So we're going to take a look at some example code now just to illustrate what we mean by all of this. So let's take a look at some legacy code. This is the code that I'm going to be using in the next video when we talk about um, making changes safely to legacy code. So let's take a look at some legacy code. I've got a little bit of Python here. 
for a, a, a movie rental kind of uh, business. And the, the prices of the rentals are calculated based on the IMDB rating of that movie. In other words, the better the movie, the higher rated the movie, the more we charge, the worse the movie, the less we charge. And we've got three test cases that we're interested in here. Um, we've got a price, um, which is standard of three ninety five. So we would test a standard rated movie. Um, a good movie or a great movie with a rating of more than seven, we add a pound. And our final test that we need to check is that when the movie is a turkey, when it's a stinker, we knock a pound off the price. So three test cases. We could test this manually at the command line. For example, um, I've, I've rigged up a little sort of test harness here, a little command line program. So let's copy one of these test cases for a high rated movie. And um, we can run that from here, I think. Oops. Uh, we need to supply the name of the renter, the name of the customer and an IMDB movie ID. And what's going to happen here is it's actually going to connect to an API, an online web service, and it's going to fetch movie information and it's going to use that movie information to calculate what rental price we should be charging. So let's run that and see what happens. Okay, it wasn't too bad there. A little, little bit of a delay there. And we've got three of those tests. Now, obviously, if we're testing manually, our, uh, our build cycles are going to be very slow. So we could probably automate these, these tests. Let's call them system tests because we're going through the front door, as it were. So I've rigged up a little batch file here, a little Windows batch file that does all three of those test cases. I'm going to run those and I'm going to inspect by eye what the results look like, whether the prices are correct compared to the IMDb ratings. And you'll also notice that I've put in little hooks there to tell us when, what time this test run starts and what time it ends. So we'll get a feel in terms of hundreds of seconds as to how long these tests take to run. So these are three test cases, remember, for, for a very small amount of code. But it's going to give us a feel as to how much a much larger test um, suite might take to run. So let's run this batch file and see what happens. I'll um, maximize our screen there so we can see a bit more, a bit more real estate. Okay, there we go. We've got all three test cases. I'm just inspecting the prices and they all appear to be correct. Um, what time did it start? So it started at 54 seconds and 91 and it ended at 56 seconds and 31. So that's nearly a second and a half, one and a half seconds for three test cases. It might not sound much, but, ne but imagine this is like a, a, an average side co code base, maybe 50 to 100,000 lines of code. And there might be thousands of these tests, these system tests. So it might take thousands of seconds to retest this software when we change it. Um, even if we can break the test down, so we're running you know, tests for different parts of our code, we're still talking long execution times here. So what we've got here essentially is a testing pyramid that is upside down. If we wanted to put this in an automated build, um, those builds would be slow because we're connecting to this web service. Um, and we would need to do something about that. And this is where our architecture comes in, our design principles. In particular, principles for modular design. The problem is this module here, this class, Pricer, um, the logic for pricing videos is bound up inside the same class, inside the same method. So there's the logic that retrieves the information. And there's our pricing logic. What we've got here is a pricer class that is doing more than one job, more than one job. So that's our, one of our, that's the first principle of good modular design is that each module should only do one job because we want to make it possible to test this logic that I've highlighted here without executing that code. So we would need to refactor this. So we have another class um, that actually fetches the IMD movie uh, information um, and hides the details of how that is done. So we need to encapsulate that inside another class. Um, and very importantly, we need to make it possible to uh, essentially substitute a different implementation. In other words, we'd like to be able to stub the code that I've highlighted here and just re return a hard-coded IMDB rating so that we can test the pricing logic without actually connecting to the web servers. So I'm going to pause the video here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to refactor this so that it is possible for me to write unit tests 
using stub versions um, for our IMDB information, our movie information, such that it is possible to test our pricing logic, to test that the prices are calculated correctly without connecting to the web service. So here's the refactored version. As you can see, um, we're actually injecting, we're using dependency injection in the constructor here to pass in an object that fetches the movie information that we're going to use to calculate um, the price for our movie. And we're able to then, in our program here, actually pass it in from the outside. But we can also do that inside a set of unit tests here. So we've got some unit tests, and I'm using uh, mocking essentially to create um, uh, stub versions here. I know it's a bit of a mi mixed metaphor. They're using mocking to create stubs. But strictly speaking, these are stubs because they're returning test data there. We're not testing the interactions with this IMDB stub. Um, so we're using magic mock essentially to create a stub version of fetch movie that ret returns a hard coded rating. Doesn't really matter what the title is, doesn't matter what the IMDB ID is either. All that matters is the rating and the price. So I've recreated those three test cases that we had in our little batch file there, but I've recreated them as fast running unit tests. And if you take a look, as I just run the unit test just now, they run in four milliseconds, four milliseconds. So we've gone from one and a half seconds for those three test, test cases to four milliseconds, but they are essentially the same tests. We've also added some flexibility to the design in doing this. So for example, if we wanted to use a different source of ratings, it's going to be much easier to do that now because um, our pricer doesn't actually know where the ratings are coming from. We've separated that concern. And that's why separation of concerns and, and good modular design are very, very essential to achieving that testing pyramid, that upside, that right way up pyramid. Um, TDD can really help here because if we actually test drive our code to begin with using unit tests, then that's going to require us to make design decisions to make the code unit testable so that we can unit test it. Um, so we're going to stub and we're going to mock and we're going to use dependency injection um, to inject those objects in so that we don't need to test with external dependencies. So there you go, that's the testing pyramid. It is a very, very, very important topic and it's very, very important um, to take care of business in terms particularly of design to make sure that your as much of your code is as possible is easily unit testable. So you're always looking for opportunities to separate those, particularly those the concerns of external dependencies, talking to databases or reading files or any of that stuff. So look out for that. So there you go, that's the testing pyramid. Um, in the next video, um, you can um, subscribe or or, or hit the uh, the the, uh, the notification bell bell a bell if you want to hear more about um, codemanship videos in the future. Um, but in the next video, we're going to be talking about legacy code, and we're going to be revisiting this example that I've just refactored. But I'm actually going to show you not just how I refactored it, but why I refactored it. Um, so that's going to be the next video, very closely related to the testing pyramid and to continuous integration and continuous delivery.